Now we're going to talk about the intersection between religious belief and authoritarianism. Awesome. So much fun and joy and mirth today. Thank you, Dev, for these lighthearted conversations. But sadly, this is where we are right now. And in our next session, we're going to go from panel to panel. You guys, are, can we do it? Let's do it. All right. Thank you for that one desperate woot in the back. Uh, PRRI, which we all know and love, Public Religion Research Institute, has conducted an eye-opening study that explores how faith and denominational ties shape Americans' views on autocratic governance. And of course, to help us understand this, we all know Robbie Jones. Robert Jones, the president and founder of PRRI, will give us insights from the study and for once, for the love of God, give us good news, Robbie. Each time I read his poll, my heart stops for like 30 seconds and I was told that you have uh, some terrifying but important uh, data to give us this time around. Uh, following this amazing presentation, uh, Melissa Deckman will moderate another discussion with Ruth ben Giot, Professor of History and Talent Studies at NYU, Odette Youssef, you all heard from her last night, National Security Correspondent on Extremism at NPR, and Robbie, focusing on the role of faith institutions and how they can play in resisting, resisting the rise of authoritarianism. The discussion is uh, going to be sobering, uh, a bit frightening, but ultimately, hopefully, inshallah, insightful and hopeful. Yes? God willing, yes. Okay, thank you. I'll take it. All right. Uh, please welcome to the stage Melissa Deckman, Ruth Van Giat, Odette Youssef, and Robbie, you're up. All right. Oh, good. All right. Well, hi, everyone. Uh, we're happy uh, to be unveiling a brand new survey. It is hot off the press this morning. Um, so this is a uh, survey day that we conducted back in June, but have been busy crunching the numbers and getting the analysis. Uh, it is up on our website at prri.org. Many of you may have gotten an email from us this morning. Uh, if you did not and want to be on that list in the next time, please do let us know. Uh, but we're happy to kind of roll out this data. Um, I, because of the constrained uh, time we have here, am only going to be able to scratch the surface. So I'm going to give you just a very 30,000, maybe even a 50,000 foot flyover uh, of some of the main findings. We have a press release, we have a full page report with dozens of charts uh, all on the website, but I'm gonna give you just a, a heads up of, of some of the patterns that we see uh, in the data. If there are breaks uh, that you don't see in the charts, we do have it in the report, right? So if you want Republicans or evangelicals or Catholics or the unaffiliated or whatever, we have that uh, for you. Uh, you can just kind of see us afterward uh, or ask a question during the event uh, or it's available online. So without further ado, uh, let me just jump in here. Um, so uh, as I said, this uh, survey was conducted in June. It's a fairly large survey. It's over 5,000 uh, interviews and a random probability sample uh, that PRI conducted uh, across three weeks in June, the margin of error for the full sample, that is the whole national sample, uh, is less than two percentage points. So plus or minus 1.58 uh, percentage points. The margin of error for subgroups is a little bigger than that. Uh, but overall, uh, fairly high confidence uh, in, in uh, the, the, the sample size that, was, that we'll see. Um, so one of the things we did is to, there's been a lot of talk about authoritarianism in the country, rising authoritarianism, particularly in the Trump era. So how do we measure uh, something? It's a fairly challenging thing uh, to measure. So luckily, we went back and there's been a lot of social science, political science literature out there. Uh, and actually, this, this whole stream of data actually flows from World War II, right, and the rise of fascism in Europe. So there's a whole set of research that begins in the late 40s and early 50s and continues on up through the present. We've drawn on a lot of that literature, uh, particularly for this first scale that we're calling the, the right-wing authoritarianism scale. Basically, the way we do this, when trying to measure a challenging concept like authoritarianism, uh, you don't want to rely on just one question. So what we've done is ask a series of questions. In order for somebody to score high on an authoritarian scale, it means they have to answer fairly consistently across all these questions. So they can't just answer high on one, low on another. It has to be fairly consistent to score high here. So we, here are the questions that we use in the scale. Um, what our country really needs is a strong, determined leader who will crush evil and take us back to our true path. These are all agree, disagree, uh, and they're like completely agree, strongly agree, et cetera. Uh, I won't read them all, but you can basically see them here. The last one, uh, similar. The only way our country can get through the crisis ahead is to get back to our traditional values, put some tough leaders in power, and silence the troublemakers. 
uh, spreading bad ideas. So you get the idea of the sentiments. And again, people had to agree with all of these. Now in the study, we actually had two different uh, versions of this. There's another set of research that is um, focused on a different set of sensibilities and uh, try to get away from the political and measuring it uh, more abstractly in terms of child rearing. What kind of traits would you like to have in your children? And it kind of gives people pairs. I'd rather have my child have good manners or I'd rather have my child be curious. I'd rather have my child be, have respect for elders or be independent and et cetera. You can see the pairing up here. Uh, and that one is called the child rearing authoritarianism scale. In the report, we kind of scope both of these out so you can see how they play. Uh, interestingly enough, even though they're fairly different scales, uh, at the national level, what you'll see here is that on the right-wing authoritarianism scale, it's about four in 10 uh, Americans who score either high or very high uh, on that scale. That is either completely agree or mostly agree with uh, most of those statements there. About 20% of the country has mixed views. They may be all over the map, high on one, low on another. Uh, and um, here is about another 37%, nearly four in 10 on the other side as well, who uh, are scored low uh, on that scale. Interestingly enough, when we look at the other scale, uh, we see a fairly similar distribution. Now, they do behave differently in different subpopulations, but at the national level, we see a fairly um, uh, reasonable agreement between these two scales. For the sake of the presentation, I'm going to stay with the first one, uh, the right-wing authoritarianism scale, uh, in, in, the, uh, in the, the rest of the uh, presentation. So, start off with party. Uh, here, so you can see the way this is distributed across party. Uh, we've been talking about polarization, and one of the things that you'll see in the political science literature is a term called asymmetric polarization. What this means is that the parties aren't exactly evenly polarized, right? That typically on these kinds of measures, what we'll see here, and you'll see it here, these are just the two, first two bars, or those scoring very high or high, uh, is that uh, independents are actually closer to Democrats than they are to Republicans. So Republicans are more outliers compared to both Democrats and independents. What's interesting here is that we can actually see this, the, the influence of Trump on the Republican Party because there's this big divide between Republicans who have a favorable view of Trump and Republicans who do not have a favorable view of Trump. You can just see this jump. In fact, Republicans who do not have a favorable view of Trump look like the general population. Um, on this scale, right? It's Republicans who have a favorable view of Trump that really stand out here. It's 75% of them uh, who score high, high or very high uh, on the right-wing authoritarianism scale. Democrats are down at 28% uh, on the high end of the scale. And here are the other two uh, sides. You can see it rounding out. So we're here uh, at Religion News Service. So what about religion? Um, so here's the chart you've all been waiting for, right? Um, how does it break down across uh, religious lines? Uh, and here um, you will see uh, Basically, we've got they're all Americans at the top. There's one group that scores higher than anyone else. It's not a surprise. It's, it's the base, all right? Donald Trump's strongest base. White evangelical Protestants, it's nearly two-thirds of them who score either high or very high. There are also two other groups here that are in majority territory. That is Latino Protestants and white Catholics. Now, both of those groups voted about six and 10 for Trump. Uh, in the last election. So that the Latino Protestants, as many of you in this room know, uh, are, are tend to be evangelical in their orientation or charismatic in their orientation uh, as well. And some of that uh, evangelical political orientation uh, kind of comes along for the ride there. The rest of the groups look much closer to the general population are below. And the two groups on the other end that really stand out are Jewish Americans and religiously unaffiliated Americans who are the least likely to score high uh, on the uh, right-wing authoritarianism uh, scale. There's the rest of the, the breakout. Um, so uh, also I want to kind of point this out is that we, we did find a positive correlation between attending church uh, and scoring higher on the right-wing authoritarianism scale. So uh, those who attend religious services uh, once a week or more, uh, it is 55% uh, of majority who score high there. And you can just see it kind of step down a little bit. Uh, the, the, um, the fewer times you go to church on average a week, um, the, the lower you score on the right-wing authoritarianism scale. Some of that is because that top category is uh, overrepresented by white evangelicals, who we saw on that other slide are the highest uh, group. They tend to be the group that attends religious services higher uh, than others. Uh, as many of you may know, um, we at PRI have been doing a lot of work around uh, authoritarianism, threats to democracy. We released a very a major study um, uh, last year uh, on uh, Christian nationalism where we did a similar exercise to measure a Christian nationalism based on a whole series of statements created in a Christian nationalism scale. I'm not gonna go into all that now, happy to get to more of that later, but basically we came up with four categories and I wanted to kind of show you the correlation between authoritarianism 
and Christian nationalism. It's quite high, um, as you might expect, but just to see it here. So the categories uh, down the left side here are the Christian nationalism categories. So Christian nationalism adherents are those who basically believe a whole series of statements like the U.S. should declare itself a Christian nation. U.S. law should be based on the Bible, like those kinds of uh, statements here. Adherents are the ones, again, who agree with almost all those that series of statements. Uh, sympathizers are those who agree with most. Skeptics uh, disagree with most. Rejectors um, disagree with all of them. And you can just see this positive cor correlation. In fact, it's 84% of Christian nationalism adherents qualify as either uh, uh, very high or high uh, right on the right-wing uh, authoritarianism scale. And it's almost linear, uh, this step down, right? The sort of uh, higher you are on the Christian nationalism scale, the higher you are on the right-wing authoritarianism scale. So what does this mean across attitudes here? i am give you just a few. Um, uh, so I see Matthew Taylor in the room here. Um, hi, Matthew. Th this is for you. Um, <laughs> so uh, uh, were some theological kind of Christian dominionist attitudes, theological attitudes here that we asked to see if there's a correlation between those. Again, I'm not going to read all of these, but like the first one here, um, you can just see, and I'm just kind of stepping down the categories, but among those who score very high on the right-wing authoritarianism scale, 76% of them agree with this statement that the final battle between good and evil is upon us, a kind of apocalyptic uh, feeling of politics, and Christians should stand firm in the full armor of God. Uh, here is a kind of a dominionism a statement, the seven mountains of society, 54% of those who score high on the uh, authoritarianism scale agree uh, with that statement. And again, you can sort of see the, the other thing here. This is a kind of a Christian nationalist type theological statement about America chosen by God. It's lower, but the pattern still, uh, still is there uh, in, in the statements. Um, the other thing we found is high support for patriarchal gender roles, kind of hierarchical understandings of men uh, versus women uh, uh, here. And we see this society as a whole has become too soft and feminine. This is an old GSS a statement that's been asked on the General Social Survey uh, for quite some time. Again, 68% uh, agreement among those who score very high on the right-wing authoritarian scale. And then uh, one about kind of gender roles, society better off when men and women stick to the jobs and tasks they've been naturally suited for, right? Again, a majority of those who score high on the right-wing authoritarianism scale uh, uh, agreeing with that, with that statement. Uh, the other one that is like very, very consistent, these are three fairly extreme statements on immigration here. And we find, again, across the board, uh, if we ask uh, like whether, and these, some of these came from actual statements from Trump, for example, the first one, immigrants are entering the country illegally today and poisoning the blood of our country. Um, we should round up all the immigrants here in the country illegally, even if it takes setting up encampments guarded by the U.S. military. Um, and immigrants are invading our country and replacing our cultural and ethnic background. You can see in the country, it's about one in three Americans who agree uh, with those statements, uh, but you'll just see this jump up here. When you look at the right-wing authoritarianism scale, it's two-thirds, right, of those who score highest on that scale agreeing uh, that immigrants are poisoning the blood of the country. It is two-thirds of those uh, who score very high on the right-wing authoritarianism scale saying we need uh, military-guarded encampments uh, for, for immigrants. And uh, this last one is essentially uh, the great replacement theory uh, uh, question, uh, inv immigrants invading our country, replacing our, it's essentially two thirds of those, and you can just see it step down quickly. Uh, so this high correlation between kind of harsh anti-immigrant uh, attitudes and uh, right-wing authoritarianism as well. Um, uh, Waj, these are for you, um, uh, uh, violence uh, here and, and authoritarian leadership. We also had a set of questions that asked about um, <laughs> Uh, the leadership, particularly with presidential powers, uh, right? Uh, and so the three statements on the bottom, because things have gotten so far off track, we need a leader who's willing to break some rules if that's what it takes to set things right, all right? And it was kind of what Russell uh, Moore was talking about earlier. Things are so bad, right? We need to resort to extraordinary means. Uh, the normal rules don't apply. The normal norms don't apply. Uh, second one, necessary for the progress uh, that the president has the power to limit the influence of opposing parties. Our groups, that, that, that is a presidential power. And then finally, um, when decisions uh, by Congress or the Supreme Court uh, hold the country back, the president should be able to ignore them, right? Uh, kind of a strong executive over, uh, over the other powers. And again, you just see this, uh, those who support uh, the, or score high on the authoritarianism scale, two thirds on the break that rules. Uh, a little bit lower, but still you can see the pattern here, it's still more than one in three. Uh, say that uh, the president should be able to limit the influence of other parties, and it's about 3 in 10 uh, among that highest group who say uh, that the 
president should actually be able to ignore Congress and ignore even the Supreme Court um, uh, 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 while in office. Uh, uh, here is um, questions around uh, January 6 uh, and uh, tr specifically Trump seizing power. Uh, the first one is about, um, you know, Trump at many of his rallies will call the J6 protesters um, government hostages. We've been hearing a lot of that language here. Um, it's nearly half of those who score high on the right wing authoritarianism scale that agree uh, with that statement. Uh, and then this one, if Trump is not confirmed as the winner, he should declare the results invalid and do whatever it takes to assume his rightful place as president. It's nearly three in 10 who score very high on the right wing authoritarianism scale who agree uh, with that statement. Uh, so finally, uh, here on political violence, the good news here is that uh, these are all Americans. We've asked three different ways about the way political violence may show up uh, in the next election. The good news is that very few Americans support it, right? So we're looking at 16%, 15%, 16% uh, here saying they agree with any of these statements. Uh, the first one, uh, because things have gotten so far off track, true American patriots may have to resort to violence in order to save the country. Uh, here, again, we see the, uh, the impact of right-wing uh, the, the, uh, right authoritarianism. It's more than, uh, more than one in three uh, agreeing with that, uh, that the true American patriots may have to resort to violence to save the country. Um, it's about three in 10 uh, who say they may need armed citizens showing up at the polls uh, uh, in order, to, uh, even if it makes some other voters uncomfortable. And then finally, it's nearly three in 10 uh, uh, saying uh, that if the presidential elections uh, compromised by voter fraud, Everyday Americans need to take actions to ensure uh, the right leader takes office, even if it requires violence uh, there. So it's about three in 10 on this right-wing uh, authoritarianism scale who score high, who affirm, right? These explicitly affirm uh, taking violent actions uh, in, in the upcoming election. So I'm gonna land the plane at that uh, not so uh, hopeful place, Waj, um, here and turn it over to our, um, our panel here for a conversation. So Melissa, off to you. Thank you, Robbie. Yep. Can you hear me? Okay, good. Um, that was impressive. You really had two seconds left, and he right. got right in there. Um, I often joke with Robbie that next year's surveys will involve nothing but puppies. Um, <laughs> cats apparently are too political now, according to this election cycle. So only puppies in 2025, a softer, gentler version of PRRI. Um, we're really glad to have you here for this important report. I'm really delighted to be joined by two outstanding panelists uh, who will share their reflections about the report today. I wanna turn uh, first to Ruth as our historian on the panel. I want her to really speak about what she took from the survey and maybe a broader context of how religion helps us understand authoritarianism. Yeah, thank you. And thank you for this terrifying report, but a sobering report that we need to, we need to know about. Um, so really, the report uh, confirms um, the power of the what I, uh, concept I work with in my book, in my work, the authoritarian bargain. And these are deals that autocrats strike with different constituencies, business, finance, but the religious one is among the very, uh, the most important. Um, and um, it, it doesn't matter what the faith is, um, it matters that as these, many of these people or most authoritarians are, are depraved, impious people, frankly. And so the more corrupt they are, the more violent they are, the more they need the moral legitimacy uh, provided by the religious institution. They need the priests or whoever it is out there blessing them. Um, and they need that aura of holiness for their personality cults. So. The, the great example is uh, Vladimir Putin and the Russian Orthodox Church. They have followed, and once these bargains are struck, uh, they're very durable. Um, and um, it, we also have Viktor Orban in Hungary. Now, what happens though is when you have authoritarians in power, they make, um, they tend to make these bargains with the most authoritarian, with, with the faith traditions that have the most authoritarian leanings and culture. So progressive faith traditions are marginalized under authoritarian rule. And so Viktor Orban, he has uh, made himself the defender of white Christian civilization and he's the Christian warrior. We don't hear about the fact that 300 churches have been closed um, forcibly because their heads were not loyal. <laughs> so, but the, the other thing the report uh, get, uh, really confirms is 
uh, in the American context, um, the success of Donald Trump's authoritarian bargain and the success of his personalization of politics and his personality cult. Um, and Fox News is the other you know, partner here. And so over and over again, we find that <clears throat> Republicans who view Trump favorably um, have more authoritarian views, and these views mirror the extremist things that Trump has been preaching for them. And really, we see here, um, with Trump being anointed as you know, there by the will of God, we see the same kind of political religion, deification of the leader as was true under fascism, led by Mussolini, a complete atheist who hated the church, but was the one who made the deal with the Vatican. So just want to say um, all the components of the authoritarian playbook are here. Um, and they were just uh, listed in frightening detail, whether it's belief that breaking the rules might be necessary. This is the core of authoritarianism that you must break the rules in order to have law and order. You, you transform the rule of law into rule by the lawless. So breaking the rules, I'm very glad you had that question. It's absolutely crucial. And what does breaking the rule mean? It means corruption. It also means violence. It means any kind of sin. Cre and when, that's where the blessing of the religious tradition is so important because it's not just the leader, it's the followers who are engaging in corruption and violence because that is what is rewarded by the party. Um, and so I'll stop there on that happy note. Thank you. Um, I want to turn to Adette for her thoughts on some of the findings, but also with respect to how religion might help us understand domestic extremism, which is really what you cover at NPR. Yeah, um, so I was very happy for this survey as well because um, I feel like in my reporting I have come across so many examples of um, individuals who are part of extremist movements or extremist organizations um, that also um, are uh, Christian. And, you know, I'll recall that, you know, I remember we were interviewing for um, a podcast several years ago, um, the child of a, a neo-Nazi leader, I believe this was in Wisconsin, um, and she was describing how her father had only two books on his nightstand, Mein Kampf and the Bible. And this, you know, they, she was raised Catholic. Another example, um, I was in North Idaho two years ago um, to cover a story about an LGBTQ gathering that had been under sustained pressure from um, uh, you know, really far right players to shut down their event. And while I was there, I took the opportunity to, to do sort of like a tour of the area of Hayden, Idaho, where Aryan nations for uh, some time had their um, complex. And um, I was being driven by the compound uh, by this retired attorney named Norm Gissel, um, who was the man who actually brought a case of a, a Native American woman and her son who had been brutally beaten by these neo-Nazis who were uh, living on this compound um, to the attention of the SPLC, which then succeeded in this milestone uh, civil uh, case um, putting the Aryan nations out of business. All this to say, um, they had to forfeit the property as part of this settlement. And Norm Gissel finally had a chance to enter the premises. And he recalls that there was a church on the property and he walked into the church and there was the bust of Adolf Hitler um, at the altar. And then he walked into Richard, Richard Butler was, the, was sort of the head of the Aryan nations at the time. He watched into the, walked into the house that Richard Butler and his wife lived in on the property, went into the kitchen and there on the kitchen wall was a framed portrait of Tammy Faye Baker. And so these, you know, so I've been observing that these two things have um, existed side by side um, in the lives of extremists. And um, so part of what I have sought to do in my reporting is to understand how that can be. What are the elements um, that seem to be drawing people both to um, their faith beliefs and also to extremist and author authoritarian movements? Um, 
There was a former neo-Nazi leader um, in Chicago. His name is Christian Picciolini, and he's become a bit of a national figure since then in educating the public about um, far-right extremist groups and movements and helping people to disaffiliate from some of these groups. And I worked with him on a podcast, and he really sums it up nicely. He says the draw is not necessarily the beliefs themselves. The draw is that these um, projects offer community and identity and purpose. And I think that is sort of like, the, those are sort of the elements that people are finding in both of these worlds. And I would add one more thing to that, which is um, they offer the convenience of defined roles for the individual. And I think that's where we sort of get into what, um, Robbie, you mentioned with patriarchy. Because when we think of the current political moment, why is gender um, such um, a unifying issue right now, particularly on the right? Defining what, what gender is, what gender roles should be, um, making hard lines uh, about what gender, you know, there are two genders, you know. And, um, you know, I think that the, the increased visibility that we have today of gender non-conforming people um, is deeply disturbing to people who are drawn to defined roles in society and defined order in society. And so I think all of this sort of helps us understand the current political moment that we're in. Um, that's a really nice segue for a question I have for Ruth, in fact. Um, in her book, Strong Men, um, which I'm sure you all have read, you should read it again because it's really chilling to think about it in the context of this presidential election campaign. Um, but you have a chapter on virility. Uh, and so I'm just wondering um, if you could maybe share your thoughts on religion, masculinity, and what our survey findings had to say with respect to patriarchy. Yeah. Um, you know, my book was the first book that um, has a chapter on virility, masculinity, machismo, however we want to call it, and elevates that to what I call a tool of rule, alongside propaganda, violence, corruption, and the, the myth of the great nation, which is the chapter that includes stuff about um, the leader as there by the will of God. <laughs> Um, and only he can realize the destiny, and he, in fascist Italy, had to be capitalized. Mussolini insisted on it. And um, one of the things I found in doing the research is when we try and answer the question of when do charismatic demagogues have an appeal? When do authoritarians have an appeal? There's a pattern over 100 years. It's when people perceive um, a crisis of masculinity when they feel that there's been too much change and progress, it could be workers' rights, it could be uh, racial equity, but gender is a very good way, a category to analyze this. And the solutions are cyclical. <laughs> I have quotes in there of Mussolini who had a pronatalist movement um, on the grounds, and he linked it to his version of great replacement theory. And he said, cradles are empty, and cemeteries are full in Italy. And too many, quote, black, brown, and yellow people are having babies, and they're invading. So, um, and I trace that up to Orban and Bolsonaro and, of course, Trump. And so women become, under authoritarianism, uh, tools of the state, just assets to manipulate, to have the babies, as Orban says, we need Hungarian babies, i.e. white Christian babies, not any babies. And so, but I also wanna just to make one point, and this is about breaking the rules. A very sinister part of this is making it, so authoritarianism is about taking away the rights of the many, including women, uh, LGBTQ people, and allowing the few, the, the elites, to have more liberties than they ever dreamed. That extends to the right to plunder women's bodies. So I want to remind everyone um, that Donald Trump partly decriminalized domestic violence. It's in my book. Um, to make it easier for women to be um, abused. And so that's part of the same dynamic. Making, taking, impoverishing women, 
um, taking away their choice of their, around their bodily autonomy, but also taking away their freedoms and, and giving more freedoms to men so that they feel patriarchy is defended in this way and empowered, not just defended, um, bolstered with more um, dominion, if I can use that word, than ever before. Thank you. Um, Odette and I were having a conversation before the panel about the findings in our report with respect to childhood traits. And so Robbie presented findings on the right-wing authoritarian scale, but I think the, right, the childhood traits are really fascinating and have a long history in social science as well. Um, so I just wanted to do, maybe elaborate a little bit about that. So what about that battery of findings do you think is really relevant for understanding our politics today? Yeah, the, the, I, I love that you all were asking questions about child rearing because I feel like, um, you know, for the for the people that I've um, reported on, um, who come who were raised in extreme in neo Nazi households, for example, you know, the household was the place where um, their notions of how the world should be could actually be realized, and so. Um, it was a really interesting thing because I was interviewing often the children of um, parents who were in some part affiliated with the organized white supremacist movement. And some of these children were gay. Some of the children were actually biracial because often it was like the, the mother, uh, the mothers were traditional. They didn't work um, because you know they sort of bought into sort of the gender roles of, that were espoused by this broader movement, and so they would marry. You know, they would sort of have multiple partners over their lifetime, and so the children would then have um, fathers who were neo Nazis or members of the KKK, and and then they had step siblings too, and you know some of these kids were gender non-conforming, some of them were biracial, some of them were gay. And for me, it was very interesting to hear their experiences because seeing how those dynamics play out within one household, I just felt offered some lessons as we see you know, pro-authoritarian movements try to enact some of these same kind of ideas at a societal level in the US and in a much more diverse context. That's why we're seeing such a backlash among, I think, younger generations, right, to, to those kinds of policies, too. Um, before I turn it to Q&A to the audience, I wanted Robbie a to give Robbie a chance to respond and maybe to speak to some hopefulness. Um, you know, I know Robbie spends lots of time talking to churches about the threat of Christian nationalism. So maybe, Robbie, if you could talk a bit about what our survey might say for giving people tools to combat some of these, these threats that we face. Thank you. Um, yeah, um, so you know, here's what I would say. There's a way of looking at this data, and it is absolutely terrifying. Um, you know, even if we only have one in three, uh, right, Americans on some of these statements, that's a lot of people, right? Um, and, uh, and what, but here's what I would say. Like, if you look at ver things like uh, even the, the authoritarianism scale, the Christian nationalism scale, it is an overwhelming majority of Americans who reject these views, right? So it's two to one. Americans reject Christian nationalism. It's 60 to 40 that Americans reject authoritarianism. Now, that still leaves a sizable minority to be worried about, and the challenge is because of our binary political system, it's kind of coalesced into one of two political spaces, right, that gives it actually more power and more amplification than it actually has if you're just counting uh, noses uh, down the ground. So I, I think one of the things I keep thinking about is, like, even on our hot-button issues, right, you think about uh, abortion, like two-thirds of the country supports, uh, says that abortion should be legal in all or most cases. If you think about uh, LGBTQ rights, uh, two-thirds of the country uh, say that gay and lesbian couples should be allowed to marry legally uh, today. These are not like 50-50 uh, questions, but the challenge is uh, that we have a kind of three in 10, like a, nearly one-third of Americans who are kind of dug in, who tend to be white, non-Hispanic, and Christian, and who are kind of I think, you know, tied into this hierarchical, uh, authoritarian, Christian nationalist worldview. And I think that's kind of the challenge that we're facing uh, right now. And it is because uh, the country is changing. It's a backlash movement, right, to kind of 
demographic and religious change uh, in the country. So I guess if there's places that have full, there are churches on the ground doing things, uh, right, to kind of solidify, to support democracy. We've heard from one of them this morning um, already. And I think that's where the hope is, even though this other thing is where we get, I think, a lot of the scariest um, headlines, but there's a lot of, it's not where the country is today. Great, I'd like to open it up for questions from the audience. Thank you for this totally depressing, um, but very important new study. Thank you. And so this is really a question about the study. Do we have longitudinal data about those findings about all Americans, you know, all Americans feeling a particular way about immigration? And how, how is that trending? Well, I, I would say on immigration, I mean, I think remarkably most Americans support things like uh, acts for dreamers, right? So to give them a pathway to citizenship. And so again, getting back to Robbie's two-third, one-third country, I think in general, uh, most Americans are broadly supportive of immigration reform, um, but that's not where the political, you know, that's not politically where we are with the Republican Party. I think we included these specific questions on detaining immigrants um, really to kind of break some new news to see exactly where the country was on, on those issues. Robbie, did you want to add? Yeah, so one of the longest standing questions we have is actually about a path to citizenship for immigrants who are in the country illegally. I, and we've been asking that question for 15 years now, and remarkably, it has been fairly stable. And again, it's 60% of the country who says they support a path to citizenship for immigrants who are in the country illegally. It used to be, uh, the one place we have sh seen shift is among Republicans over time. Uh, back when we first asked this question, say 2009, 2010, we did find a slim majority of Republicans favoring that path to citizenship. It has now slipped uh, below that mark, uh, but Democrats have come up, right? So we see a little more polarization. Uh, the national numbers haven't moved that much, but the parties have moved further apart on that. And I think it's uh, very clearly, right, uh, with the influence of Trump taking over the Republican Party. And I would just add to religiously, gone are the days of welcoming the stranger. Do you remember that about a decade ago, that there was a large religious coalition to try to pass comprehensive immigration reform? And that's clearly not where uh, the GOP is right now. Hello. Hi there. Lisa Sharon Harper. Um, Ravi, good to see you. And I have a question regarding the question of race and how it plays into all of this. And Thea Butler earlier today just said that we need to talk more about it. Um, Robbie, you just mentioned it. It was very helpful, I think, uh, in the context that you brought it up, that uh, the question of whiteness. And um, also, in one of your slides, you talked about the folks who have a very high um, uh, propension for authoritarianism, and then those who are sympathizers. And I know that in an earlier uh, survey that you've done, and also other sociologists have done, they've shown that more than 50% of the church today actually is either sympathizers or um, adherents to Christian nationalism or white Christian nationalism. And so the question that I have is, um, to what degree should the church be engaging in the project of um, interrogating its own narratives in the way that you did in your last book? Um, looking back and asking how are we, how have we been part of the problem? How have we contributed not only through our theology, which we did get at earlier, but the decisions we've made about how we run our, our institutions, um, who is a part of our institutions, who's in, who's out. Um, and the reason I ask that is because it feels like we're going to be back here next year, maybe again in two or three years, if we don't actually get to root causes um, and how they are how they are rooted in our institutions and in our um, in in our systems the way we, the ways that we do things with regard to race and whiteness in particular. I guess that's me. Um, uh, so I mean, Lisa, as you know, I've been wrestling with this question a lot. Uh, so I grew up Southern Baptist in Mississippi. Um, I come right out of that white evangelical. Uh, world, and I think one of the biggest questions that I've been wrestling with in sort of my own writing and, and research is, is whiteness, right? Where does it show up? What work did it do, right? Um, and how was it important? And I think it goes to this hierarchy uh, question, right? So race is part of the hierarchical setup, and it's one of the things that, like, we have just, as a country, um, all along been struggling to break out of this thought, right, that this country 
is of, by, and for white Protestant Christians, right? And that's the move, right? Um, so, but it comes with all these hierarchies, white over non-white, men over women, straight over non-straight, like, uh, you know, this native born over non-native born, like there's all these, but it's, it's hierarchies and everybody knowing their place, right? And that's the thing we're struggling, I think, to break, to break out of. And whiteness has always been so tied up uh, right? I mean, the largest, you know, I grew up in the largest denomination this country has ever seen, the Southern Baptist Convention that Russell Moore was talking about this morning, uh, right? And that is the largest expression of Christianity, the largest single expression of Christianity in the country. It is also the denomination that was formed in 1845 with the express purpose of making slavery compatible with the gospel. Right, so that's the legacy that we're still we're still struggling with today. It's, it's absolutely essential. I'd like to get back to um, the chart where you break out different faith communities and and how they respond to the questions about authoritarianism. And I'm wondering about causality. To what extent um, can we re do we have any insight as to whether or not it is being affiliated with a particular tradition that makes people more prone to be authoritarian, or does it go the other way? Does it that people who are not authoritarian leave um, a tradition that has an authoritarian leader and moves to something which is more progressive or more disorganized? Um, or, and to what extent does it go the other way, that the people who are looking for strong rules and strong leaders become Southern Baptists? I mean, what is, is there any insight that you have on that? I don't know that we have any uh, data in this report that speak to that, but I would just say, I mean, many, maybe anecdotally, looking at how lots of moderates have left evangelical, ex-evangelicals, I think because of those tendencies and because I think what's espoused by leaders is not comporting with the values that individuals themselves hold. I do think that what's really important, and maybe Ruth can speak to this as well, given her research, the importance of leadership and the narratives that come from the top down um, and how that either repels people or maybe brings them into kind of those sorts of um, kind of the authoritarian mindset. Yeah, um, it, it can seem like a chicken and egg thing, but um, you know, Trump and his partners, very important partners like uh, uh, the extremist Michael Flynn, whose reawaken America tour is like a radicalization vehicle, who has abused the notion of holy war in ways that we talked about earlier. Um, they have, all these people have sought out very actively using the language of savior and victim and martyr um, in ways that are going to appeal to um, this population. And so there's a synergy that's created. And they also, this is where the bargain comes in. They, they're, they're actually um, rewarding um, you know, Christian nationalists, encouraging th them to accept things that are more and more extreme. And uh, remind everyone during uh, Trump's presidency, the Office of Civil Rights, then this is under Roger Severino, uh, an Opus Dei adjacent Catholic, because there's Trump made a huge amount of space for far right Catholics. Um, the Office of Civil Rights within the Department of Health and Human Services uh, was transformed by Severino from an office for civil rights for, for African Americans to white Christian defense the rights of white Christians. So they give, they give them goodies. They give them, they, they, they seem to um, uphold their interests. And in return, the charismatic demagogue says, I will be a leader for you if you support me. And so they take them along on a ride. And the tragedy that the history of authoritarianism shows everywhere is that once they're in, they are uh, on a road that leads to more and more extreme things, more violence, mass violence sometimes. And they're still on that road locked with the leader until they decide to leave. And if I can add, you know, I, I appreciate that the question is sort of interrogating, you know, how much is this draw to authoritarianism coming from, you know, certain Christian sects and how much is it, you know, extremists finding their way to certain Christian sects. And um, one of the um, phenomenons that I 
uh, explored in my reporting was why it seems an increasing number of um, far-right extremists, neo-Nazis have been, uh, in America, have been converting to Orthodox Christianity. Um, and this ties back to the point that Ruth made earlier of the bargain that Putin made with the Russian Orthodox Church and sort of the role that um, Putin and the Russian Orthodox Church sort of um, have assumed as sort of the standard bearer in um, an orthodox, like a traditional way of life. Um, and so some of it is, you know, extremist sort of shot. And I think also, if I may add one more point, I think the pandemic played a critical role in all of this because um, that was a catalyzing moment um, for some people to start to view the state as inter with the lockdowns, to see the state as overreaching into churches and for some people to start to seek out the churches that refused to close during the lockdowns and many of those were Orthodox churches. I know we need to close, so i add one quick thing. Uh, if you wanna see, I think a very good example of this kind of giving goodies and quid pro quo uh, between Trump and evangelicals. And I know RNS covered this very well. Thank you uh, very much, RNS, is his speech to the National Religious Broadcasters back in February. Uh, go back and look at the transcript of that, uh, that speech. It is unbelievable. Like, it's, it's where he says, like, we've got to bring our religion back. Right? We're going to bring back the churchgoer, this kind of decline, but I'm going to bring it back. Uh, right? um, and we're not going to have a country anymore if you don't vote for me. Like All of that kind of language is just rife throughout um, that speech. What's hardly there? Abortion. Right? But all kinds of conversation about the country in decline. I'm the one who can bring it back, and I'm going to bring you back with me when I do that. I think we're going to have to end it there, but uh, thank you so much for being such a great audience.